One Sunday in July, the Youth Association had organized a trip to a nearby sanctuary. I had been asked out on that day by the shop assistant, Max, who worked next door. The girl he usually went out with was ill in hospital. He knew well that he had caught my eye. I wasn't thinking of marriage at that stage. He was quite well off, but he was far too attentive to all the girls. And I, who always had possessed a certain probity, wanted a man who would belong uniquely to me. I didn't just want to be a wife, but an only wife. The next day, I described to you how much I had enjoyed myself that Sunday. We certainly didn't hold any priest-filled conversations like you people. Your first question was, did you go to Mass? You fool! How could I have done, since I had to leave at six in the morning? You know that I added in an excited voice, the good God hasn't got the same little mind as your wretched priests have. Now I have to confess that God, notwithstanding his infinite goodness, weighs things with even greater precision than all the priests do. After that first outing with Max, I came to the association once more at Christmas to celebrate the feast. There was something that enticed me to come, but internally I had already parted company from you. Cinemas, dances, outings, one after the other. Max and I quarreled sometimes, but I always knew how to monopolize his attention again. His other girlfriend was most irksome. When she came back from hospital, she behaved like one possessed. In fact, this was fortunate for me, because my dignified calm made some impression on Max, who ended up deciding that I was his favorite. I succeeded in making her despicable in his eyes, by speaking coldly, seeming to be positive, while interiorly vomiting poison. Such feelings and such behavior are an excellent preparation for hell. They are diabolical in the strictest sense of the word. Why do I tell you this? so as to relate how I separated myself definitively from God. Not that Max and I had very often reached the ultimate stages of familiarity. I understood that this would degrade me in his sight if I allowed myself to let go altogether before the right time. So I always knew how to control myself. But in itself, every time that I considered it necessary, I was always ready for anything. I had to conquer Max. With this in view, nothing was too costly. What is more, little by little we came to love one another since we both possessed certain desirable qualities which led us to esteem one another mutually. I was skillful and capable and pleasant company. Thus I succeeded at least in the last few months before the marriage to be the only one to possess him. This was my apostasy from God, making an idol of a creature. It is only in the love of a person of the other sex that this can take place in such an all-embracing fashion especially when such a love remains anchored in earthly satisfactions. This is what forms its attractiveness, its stimulus, and its poison. The adoration that I offered myself in the person of Max became my living religion. This was the period in which I gave vent to my poisonous feelings against churchgoers, priests, indulgences, rosary rattling, and similar rubbish. You tried more or less successfully to defend these things, not seeming to suspect that, rather than these other matters, what was really preoccupying me was my need for some support against my conscience. I then needed such support to justify my apostasy with my reason, too. Deep down, I was rebelling against God. You did not understand this. You thought that I was still Catholic. I even wanted to be called one. I even paid my ecclesiastical dues. A little counter-assurance wouldn't hurt, I thought. Sometimes your replies hit the nail on the head. Perhaps. On me they had no effect, because you weren't supposed to be right. Because of this distorted relationship between us, there was but little sorrow when we parted at the time of my marriage. Before our marriage, I went to confession and communion once more. It was prescribed. I and my husband thought the same about this. Why shouldn't we complete such a formality, just as we did with the other formalities? You call such a communion unworthy. Well, after that unworthy communion, my conscience felt much calmer. Anyway, it was the last one I ever made. Our conjugal life in general was one of great harmony. We agreed about everything and about this too, that we didn't want to take on the responsibility of children. Actually, my husband would have willingly accepted one. No more than one, of course. I finally even managed to dissuade him from this desire as well. Clothes, luxurious furniture, 
tea parties, outings, travelling by car and similar distractions were more important to me. The year between my marriage and my sudden death was a year of pleasure passed on earth. Every Sunday we went for a drive in the car or visited my husband's parents. They too, like us, just floated on the surface of existence. Internally, of course, I never felt happy. No matter how much I was laughing outwardly, there was always something imperceptible disturbing me. I would have liked everything to have come to an end after death, which I expected to be a long way away, naturally. But it is just as I once heard as a child in a sermon, that God rewards every good work that one accomplishes, and that if he cannot do this in the next life, he does so on earth. Unexpectedly, I received an inheritance from my Aunt Lotta. My husband succeeded in having his pay increased to a noteworthy sum, so I was able to decorate our new house very attractively. Religion's voice was only heard from afar, weak, faded and uncertain. The bars and hotels of the cities where we went during our travels certainly didn't direct us towards God. All those who frequented such places lived as we were living, from the outside inwards, rather than from the inside outwards. When, during holiday times, we visited some church or other, we sought our recreation in the artistic content of its works. I easily neutralized the spiritual aura that emanated from these churches, especially from the medieval ones, by criticizing some accessory circumstance, an awkward converse brother, or one with a dirty habit, who was guiding us around, the scandal of those monks who pretended to be pious and sold liqueurs, the endless ringing of bells for the sacred services when it was only a question of making money. In this way I managed to chase away the promptings of grace every time that they knocked. I gave my ill humor free reign with regards to certain medieval representations of hell in cemeteries or elsewhere where the devils roast souls on fiery red coals while his long-tailed companions are dragging along further victims. Clara one can make mistakes in depicting hell, but one can never exaggerate. I had a special dislike for the supposed fire of hell. You know how during an argument on that very subject, I once held a match under your nose and said to you mockingly, Does it smell like that? You quickly blew out the flame. Here it is extinguished by no one. I tell you, the fire which is mentioned in the Bible does not signify torment of the conscience. Fire is fire. What he said, get away from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire, is to be understood literally, literally. How can the spirit be touched by material fire, you will ask? How can your soul suffer on earth when you put your finger in a flame? In fact, the soul doesn't burn, but what suffering the whole individual experiences. In an analogous manner, we here are spiritually tied to fire in our nature and in our faculties. Our soul is deprived of its natural vitality. We cannot think what we want to, nor how we want to. Do not be amazed at such words. This state, which means nothing to you, is burning me continually without destroying me. Our greatest torment consists in knowing with certainty that we will never see God. How can this torture us so much, seeing that it was a matter of such indifference to us when we were on earth? While a knife lies on the table, it leaves one cold. Plunge the knife into the flesh and you begin to shriek with pain. Now we feel the loss of God, before we only thought about it. Not all souls suffer in equal measure. The greater one's malice and the more systematically one has sinned, the more severely does the loss of God weigh down on one, and the more one is suffocated by the creatures one misused. Damned Catholics in general suffer more than the adherents of other religions, because, for the most part, they received and despised more graces and more light. The one who knew more suffers more harshly than the one who knew less. The one who sinned from malice suffers more acutely than the one who fell through weakness. But nobody suffers more than he deserves. Oh, if that were not true, I would have a reason to hate. You once told me that no one ever went to hell without knowing it, and that this had been revealed to a saint. I ridiculed that, but secretly I at once took refuge behind the declaration that I would still have enough time to turn back if it became necessary. That saying is true. It is true that before my sudden end I did not know hell as it is, 
No mortal being knows it. But I was fully conscious that if I died I would go into the next world like an arrow against God, and that I would bear the consequences of this. I did not do an about turn, as I have already said, because I was dragged forward by the current of my past habits, and driven on by that conformity whereby the older a person gets, the more his acts are governed by established routine. My death took place in this way. One week ago, I speak according to your way of calculating, because if I were to judge by the pain, I could easily say that I had already been here for ten years. One week ago then, my husband and I went out for a Sunday outing, the last one for me. The day dawned radiantly. I felt better than ever. A strange feeling of happiness invaded my being and wound its way through me all day long. Then, suddenly returning home, my husband was dazzled by an oncoming car. He lost control. Yes, as I exclaimed with a shudder, not as a prayer but as a shout. A torturous pain crushed my whole being, a bagatelle in comparison with what I now suffer. Then I lost consciousness. How strange! That morning, curiously enough, I had had this thought. You could still go to Mass once more. It sounded like an imploration. Clearly and resolutely, my no cut short that line of thought. I must put an end to this once and for all, I thought, whatever the consequences may be. Now I am suffering them. You already know what happened after my death. My husband's fate and my mother's, what happened to my body and the occasion of my funeral, these things are known to me in detail due to the natural cognition we here possess. As far as the rest of what happens on earth is concerned, we only know it vaguely. But we know those things that in some way are related to us. I myself suddenly awoke from the darkness at the moment of my death. I saw myself as if inundated by a blinding light. It happened like it does in a theatre, and in the same place where my body was lying. When the lights suddenly go out, the curtains part noisily, and an unexpected scene appears, horribly illuminated, the scene of my life. As in a mirror, my soul showed itself to me. The graces I had trampled on from my youth, up to my last no, facing God. I felt like an assassin before whom the cadaver of his victim is brought, during his trial. Should I repent? Never. Should I feel ashamed? Never. Yet I couldn't bear to stand in the sight of God whom I had rejected. Like Cain fled from Abel's dead body, so my soul fled from that dreadful vision of my life. This was my particular judgment. The invisible judge said, Away from me. Then my soul, like a sulfur-yellow shadow, was precipitated into the place of eternal torment.